Hi, I'm Caroline, a teacher living in South London. Like many, I had to cancel a trip to Spain and Portugal over my school's half term, but determined not to waste my time off, I'm spending it exploring places that can be visited as a day trip from home. So far, I've spotted wildlife walking along the Wandle Trail from Croydon to Mordenhall Park, been wowed by the huge fungi and array of stunning colours in the Winkworth Arboretum and been surprised by just how tame the wild deer were in Richmond Park. In today's episode, I'll be visiting the National Trust's Polesden Lacey, exploring the house, its immediate gardens, and going for a countryside amble through its wider estate. and welcome to Polesden Lacey. Polesden Lacey is the beautiful grand old house that you can see behind us and also its immediate grounds which are really beautiful manicured gardens but there's a much wider estate as well and I think our plan is that a little bit later on once we've explored both the house and the gardens probably go on a countryside walk for a few miles through some of the woods and the farmers fields. fungi had pretty much just wilted and died and it did not look overly nice but the second point that we've come to these are what's known as King Alfred's cakes and traditionally they were used as kindling to be able to get fires started. So I've come across this fungi for a sign and it turns out that the King Alfred cakes and mushrooms that I saw King Alfred's cake mushrooms completely different. These ones are conch sized and they're pretty dark in colour so I had that one. Thank you. 
like on this fungi walk the labels have stopped now so I'm coming across a lot of fungi but I'm not really too sure what types they are or where they originate from which is a little bit of a shame because it started out really quite interestingly and of course at the moment we've got some person over there going to town I think with a chainsaw cutting up some wood and I think it's just part of the conservation of the estate and the, the rangers try and make sure that as little amount of wood goes to waste as possible and I believe that in the summer they make charcoal out of it and then in the winter they prepare the wood so that it can be used on fires to be able to heat homes with log burners. estate following one of the many waymark trails. The trail brought us past quintessential looking cottages, through open fields lined with trees whose leaves were changing. We'd watch on as the sunshine would roll across fields peeking out from the clouds and as the birds flew around us. I was taken along tree shaded pathways that framed the countryside beautifully and every now and again would open up to allow for impressive views of Polesden Lacey across the rolling hills. We were led through woods where our hiking shoes crunched under the fallen crisp leaves before being thrown out again onto farmers' grassy, chalky fields filled with sheep and the impressive house once again in the distance. undergoing restoration on these grass chalky fields. They carried out tests to see what the nutrient value of the soil was and it turned out to be very poor which at first sounds like it's a bad thing but it actually means that it's a good thing because it's so nutrient poor all different kinds of plants find it difficult to be able to grow in here and so it means that there isn't one dominant species lots of different types of plants will attempt to grow in the area so as part of the conservation they're allowing for sheep and for cows as well to graze on here during the autumn and the winter that stops any of the smaller roots that could become trees from growing into woodlands but also the hooves help to be able to compact any kind of seeds down into the grass or of any of sort of the wildflowers that might come about the sheep also are what take up the nutrients so it stops any nutrients from them being able to go into the earth. Come spring they then remove the animals from these fields that then encourages for all of the wildflowers to grow. I do wonder if that bridge maybe connects gardens I think are on this side of the house so I'm wondering if maybe there's more gardens on that side and houses on that side but I want to get up top and find out where that bridge takes us to. Our walk eventually looped us back to the house and its grounds. We stopped at the cafe for a quick bite to eat where I consumed a tasty coconut veggie curry soup and grabbed some much needed caffeine to see us through the afternoon. We set off to explore the gardens, which surprisingly were full of flowers despite autumn well and truly having set in. Whilst wandering around, we learned that the garden was designed to flower for much of the year as possible, with areas designated as cut flower gardens. The gardeners would use these to then fill the vases inside of the house. and it does in fact link from the 
main gardens, across to the winter gardens. There's naturally a one-way system in place because of, you know, COVID and all the rest of it. So we're going to head over to the winter gardens first before the doubling match to rejoin that one-way system. time but rather than just sort of wandering around and just seeing the same thing we're gonna head back see the main garden and then we'll get ourselves into the actual house of Polesden Lacey was a lady called Margaret Greville and even before she'd been born she was actually a really fascinating person because she was born at the very end of 1863 and whilst the birth certificate stated her mother and father were two people with the last name of Anderson her real father was actually someone called William McEwen he was a business owner up in Scotland and because way back in the 1800s if a child was born out of wedlock they would have been classed as being illegitimate. Her real father located an employee within his company who had the same last name of Anderson as Margaret's mother. When Margaret was due to be born, he sent both obviously her mother and also this employee of his off to London to give birth to Margaret. Now, back in those days, when both of the adults had to show their identification and they both had the last name of Anderson, no one ever thought to question whether they were married or not. And so she was born into society being seen as being legitimate, even though she was actually the daughter of parents who were not married. Fast forward 21 years and Margaret's real father finally made an honest woman out of her mother. They married and again back in those days it was not great in society and so to get away from all of the gossiping the family relocated down to London. Fast forward another seven years and age 28 Margaret married a gentleman called Captain Ronald Greville. He was of good standing, or at least from a good family standing, but he himself didn't really have too much money. Whereas Margaret, she came from a family with money, so it was a mutual agreement where she would bring the money to the marriage, but she would also get to benefit from his family standing. He was an heir to a baronetcy, and I have to say that when I was finding out about the history of this place, my first question was, what's a baronetcy when it's at home? So I wouldn't be blaming you guys if you were thinking exactly the same thing. The idea of a baronetcy came about in the early 16th century. King James I was the person who was on the throne at the time, and in fairness to him, I think it was actually quite an ingenious idea. He reached out to a lot of the very wealthy families in England at the time and said to them that if they were happy to fund 30 soldiers in the army for three years, in return, they would get this title of a baronetcy. When the man of the house passed away, it would then always be passed on through the generations of the family. So really, if you've got a baronetcy, on your name what it means is just that historically your family came from a fair amount of wealth so margaret and her husband lived in mayfair but margaret's father obviously being of wealth decided to buy polesden lacey for the couple so that they could use it as their weekend retreats 
They brought on board the same designers who revamped the very upscale hotel that is the Ritz in central London to also renovate the interiors of Polesden Lacey. Sadly, a year before those renovations were due to finish, Margaret's husband passed away. Despite Margaret's husband having passed away, she still went on to throw very elaborate house parties and garden parties, which probably goes a long way to explain why the gardens are as beautiful as what we can see. These parties were attended by celebrities and royalty. The very first party was attended by King Edward VII. She had Winston Churchill come to some. She even had the Queen Anna of Spain attend as well. In 1923, the Duke and Duchess of York even came down to Polesden Lacey and they honeymooned here. Obviously, Margaret was back at her home in central London. It would have been a bit weird had she been here during that time, but I think most of society had expected that the royal family were probably going to inherit this. However, upon Margaret's death, she actually chose to hand over the estate and the house to the National Trust, and that is how and why we're allowed to be here today. I think the next stop after the gardens is going to be actually going inside the house, fingers crossed. The entrance hall was as grand as I'd expected and is where Margaret would greet her guests, but not after looking down on the women to check that none of them were wearing more jewellery than herself. Off this space was the dining room where guests were served some of the finest French cuisine. A grand hallway then led us to the saloon, the room that was the focal point at her parties where guests would gather around the grand piano or enjoy other after-dinner entertainments such as jugglers and comedians. The room was gilded in 24 karat gold, something that I'm sure left a lasting impression on the kings, majorats and politicians who came to her parties. We had a quick peek into the tea room, used for afternoon tea with guests, before going into the billiards room. This was a gentleman's club on a small scale where her male guests, including the likes of Sir Winston Churchill, could talk freely about sport, business and politics and could relax over a game of cards or billiards and read the newspaper whilst listening to the gramophone. Join me as over the next few episodes I'll be exploring the Royal Botanic Gardens of Wakehurst, seeing a condensed version of the world through trees as I'm left in awe by the autumnal colours in the North America and Asia sections. This will be followed by an early start at Sheffield Park where the morning sunlight combined with the leaves changing surprises me. If you've not done so already, be sure to hit the subscribe button so you can join me in my autumn adventures.